Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel, and I've been studying Platonism now for over 20 years. I've spoken at conferences, and I've also written a book on what Platonism is and how to practice it. All of the information that I include in these videos here on YouTube come from my own studies and also from my own experience. So last week I talked about some practical tips of how we can use the readings in this tradition to actually experience that transformation of soul that the philosophers in this tradition have written about. And I said at the end of that video that anyone who tries such techniques sincerely is going to very quickly hit into some limiting self-images that are going to really slow us down if we don't deal with them. Now, if you did not see last week's video, you don't need to see it in order to understand this one. But for those of you who did not see it but would like to, I will link it above. Okay, going on with purification, though. Our classic image of purification is someone like Socrates questioning a person about their understanding of the nature of reality and revealing that person's confusion. And so here's a quote from the sophist that I think captures that image. They, meaning people such as Socrates, cross-examine a person's words when he thinks he's saying something and is really saying nothing. And they easily convict him of inconsistencies in his opinions. Now this person being cross-examined sees this and is angry with himself. And he grows gentle toward others and thus is entirely delivered from great prejudices and harsh notions. Now we know, of course, that many of the sophists did not react to this way. This is when it goes well, of course. And I'm going to give you one more quote from this same section because it really, I think, shows us the significance of this kind of work that Socrates did. So the purifier of the soul, the person such as Socrates, is conscious that his patient will receive no benefit from the application of knowledge until he is refuted, and from refutation learns modesty. He must be purged of his prejudices first and made to think that he knows only what he knows and no more. We can see this very clearly when dealing with philosophical issues. The person who is a materialist, for example, who believes the material world is all that is real, will not be open to arguments about soul or divine if that person still has that materialist view in mind. So you have to first poke holes into that before the person starts to become curious and starts to consider other things. We're going to find the same thing happens when we are dealing with our own limiting self-images. Anyone who's ever tried to talk themselves out of an insecurity has already seen this. It doesn't matter how intelligent or how accurate the information you're saying to yourself is. Oh, I know I'm good enough and it's silly to feel small. And these things are all true, and yet you still feel it. So you have to uproot what is false before you will be able to, to manifest that healthier um, way of being. And so that's really what we need to look at here. Now here's a quote that I gave last week because I think it will be helpful to us going forward. This is the definition of purification that Plato used in the Phaedo. He says, does not the purification consist in this, which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse, in separating so far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts, now and hereafter alone, by itself, freed from the body, as from fetters. Okay, so we've got these two steps that are not necessarily separate from each other. Um, one is separating the soul from the body. That is the more mystical experience, the, um, the kinds of things that, for example, Plotinus wrote about. And also connected with that is this idea of teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together. Now that process of bringing itself together, whether you're looking at um, the more philosophical questions or you're looking at these more personal questions of your own self-image, it's about clearing away what is false. Because as long as you have competing views within the same soul, you can't collect yourself together. That's why we can have some very wise 
ideas and maybe in our, our thoughts or with our close friends, we can speak very wisely. And then in other circumstances, we find ourselves feeling very small and um, can't think straight or um, want to hold back and don't feel we can say anything. We're full of doubt and, you know, we can be very angry with ourselves. Why are we like this? And we're torn in different directions. But it's because we need to go through this other le level of purification, of clearing away what is false about our own self-image. And so what we're dealing with here is the question of self versus other. To know thyself means you have to clear away what is other, uh, an image that is false. Now, in our study of metaphysics, of course, we're focusing on what is self, what is reality, what is truth. In looking at our false beliefs, we're focusing on what is other. And in this exploration, one thing that's very important to keep in mind, which I want to say right up front, is that any self-image, even if our society deems it to be something positive and beneficial, it is still not the true self. So in other areas of life, we're going to hear people talking about knowing your true self, and they have a very different image in mind of what that means. Some people may want to trace their ancestry back to Asia or Africa, Europe, wherever, and think that that's what it means to know yourself. Well, while this may be a fruitful avenue of exploration, and it might be interesting, clearly when you're reading one of Plotinus's Enneas, and he's talking about a union with self, you can see he's going beyond this. When Socrates talks about that separation of soul from the body, gathering yourself together, the soul gathering itself together, he's talking about something beyond any social image. Also in some like pop psychiatry um, areas, you may hear people talking about dropping um, debilitating insecurities, feeling awkward and so on. And while that will me, me Ideally, it will help you function in society better. Um, it doesn't mean that you know yourself because you can function confidently. There are a lot of confident people out there who do not know themselves. That's not what we're talking about. So that means that we need to look at what are limiting self-images. What are we talking about then? Well, insecurities will come up, but they come up in a certain way that we want to look at them. We want to look at what is stopping us from manifesting a wiser state of mind. So we have a certain way of seeing ourselves, the way we're used to people reacting to us. And when we're challenging that, when we're daring ourselves to grow beyond that, the voices in our head are going to pull us back. We may hear people chiding us or telling us that we're arrogant to think we can gain wisdom. We may have our own doubts and insecurities about showing ourselves to the world. It's one thing to have certain insights and share them with people you discuss Plato with. But when you go out in the world, when you're dealing with other people, can you show that side of yourself? And that's where these insecurities will come up. Also, there are many fears that are going to come up, especially if you are really delving into the experiential side, going beyond theory. If you want to have the kind of experiences that Plotinus and others wrote about, that means you are going into, you want to participate in noose and you want to go beyond just the five physical senses, which is the way we usually um, consider the range of human experiences. Now we're going into the realm of noose, the realm of intuition, perhaps connecting with our daimon, perhaps having some peak experiences that are not widely accepted in some circles of society. And so it can create some insecurities, some doubts in ourselves. Again, those insecurities and can I do this are going to come up. You don't see yourself that way. And so it can awaken some doubts. But there are also fears, fears of the unknown, fear that it's safe to go into these realms. And so that's another thing we're going to have to deal with. And then there are social images we have to deal with. And this is true regardless of how you see yourself, whether you are popular in your school days or unpopular anywhere in between. Whatever your um, self-image is of yourself, you're going to have to deal with social images because to really get into this lifestyle means you're pulling away from mainstream society. You're pulling away from conventional ideas of what it means to be human and uh, what is important in life. And sometimes it feels like we've got a foot in two different worlds, and those worlds are islands that are floating away and we're getting ripped in half. 
And so we have to drop what is old and jump onto what is new. And that means we have to struggle with some of those images. Okay, so what are some indications then that you've hit one of these limiting self images? Because we only deal with them when they are actually blocking us from going forward in our practice. That's how we determine what we're going to work on. Otherwise, there's just, you know, you can see so many things in yourself you want to work on at the same time. But what we focus on is what is stopping me from going forward? And then once I deal with it, if I can deal with it at least adequately to keep going in my studies, then I'm going to go back to my studies. Okay, so the first thing is that we find ourselves looking for a diversion. Maybe you set yourself some time to do some reading, to meditate, whatever you want to work on at that moment. And you're very excited going into it. You have a lot of energy going into it. But then you find yourself suddenly feeling restless or antsy. And you want to find a diversion. You want to watch a movie or check your social media or do something else. You know, go out and see your friends. Or I guess during the pandemic, we can't do that so much. But you want to go out and do something. And you find yourself just needing to close the book. And it's not because you don't like what you're working on. It's because you hit a limiting self-image and it's rattling you. Another thing is focusing on practical matters, which in a way is also looking for a diversion, but it is its own special category and it has many different aspects to it. So um, many of us learned growing up that we should focus on the practical stuff, that philosophy is not practical. And so those voices will pop up in our heads now and then. Um, also working on practical things can be a way of looking for a diversion. And also we may find that when we're doing the practical stuff, we have lots of energy. But as soon as we sit down to work on a dialogue or to meditate, whatever we're working on, uh, we find that now we suddenly have no energy or maybe even a headache. What's actually happening here is our energy is getting ripped in different directions because of a limiting self-image. And so that's draining our energy and that's why we feel tired or that's why we get a headache and so on. The practical stuff, we may tell ourselves we really need to work on it, but the truth is we don't. If we set this time aside, we told ourselves we can wash the dishes later, you can wash them later. Those bills you just suddenly have to pay, well, you know what, the bank will be open tomorrow too. You can do it tomorrow. So we tell ourselves sometimes that we absolutely have to do the practical stuff right now, but I think we know that we don't. And if you set some time aside to do something philosophical, it means you have this time to do it. And so when you feel that restlessness or that need to do something practical, that's a big sign that you have hit a limiting self-image. Now, sometimes we do get through the task that we're working on, but we don't do it with excellence. And what I mean by excellence is doing it with that positive state of mind that we entered with. So we started a dialogue. Maybe, for example, there's a dialogue you really want to master. You really want to understand this one. You're very enthusiastic when you sit down to read, but somewhere a few pages in, you find yourself plodding along, and it's very hard to get into it, and there are too many states of mind that are interfering. So maybe you do get through the whole thing, but you don't do it as well as you had wanted, and you might even feel disappointed when you get to the end. Now, through all of this, all these different ways of, all these different indications of hitting a block, you'll find yourself arguing with voices in your head, and they may be imaginary people even, just sort of like a conglomerate of a certain type. This does not mean that you are insane because you're arguing with imaginary people. It means you're human, and you've hit a limiting self-image, and you are projecting that image onto these people and imagining them seeing you this way. So that's another thing I'll talk a little bit later about how to deal with that. And then also through all of this, there'll be different states of mind that interfere. These are just a few examples, feeling tired or restless, impatient, anxious. Basically, any state of mind that pulls you away from doing philosophy with excellence is an indication that you have hit a limiting self-image. Okay, so how do we overcome these images? Well, I'm going to give you some techniques that I have learned over the years, and I studied with Dr. Pierre Grimes. And he is actually the founder of the Philosophical Counseling Movement. And he first published back in the 1950s, and he's still active with it. And I do believe he is the oldest living philosopher in this field. 
Um, his main work is this one here called Philosophical Midwifery. Unfortunately, I do think it's out of print right now, but there may be some used copies floating around that you can find. For those of you who are interested in getting one of his books, he does have this workbook called Unblocking, which is currently available. And for those of you interested in it, I will put the link below for his website. And it's also available on Amazon. And it is a helpful workbook for those of you interested in it. So what I'm going to give you, though, comes from my studies with him and, and my work with his works of his books, such as this one. And I'm going to give you first kind of an overview. And in future videos, I'll go more in depth because it's such a very rich topic. There's no way to cover it all in one video. And anyway, you can't do it all at one time. It really should be done in stages. So what I'm going to give you right now is that initial layer of work that we need to do, that initial layer of purification that we need to start with. So the first thing that I recommend is to keep a journal. This is very useful because it allows us to see the themes that are coming into our thoughts. Whenever we have a distracting thought, we want to write it down, whether it's a daydream or a memory or a, a voice popping in our head, whatever it is, we want to write it down. And this allows us to start to see the patterns. Initially, we may not see them. They may seem unconnected and just kind of random things jumping all over the place. But over time, we do start to see that there is a certain intelligibility to these voices that come to us. And in fact, one thing I'll talk about as we go on here is that there's actually something providential about these limiting or these um, distracting voices. They're showing us our limiting self-image. And so there's a certain providential aspect to them. We see that initially by keeping a journal. That's the first step. Also energy building, and I think I actually stress this even more than Dr. Grimes does, because I see it as absolutely essential. We see this certainly in our study of metaphysics, that if you want to go beyond the theoretical into the experiential, to have the kind of experiences that Plotinus wrote about so beautifully in his Enneads, if you want to have those experiences, you need to build energy to go beyond the theoretical. We're going to find that the same basic principle applies in overcoming our limiting self-images. If you don't build energy, you end up at the theoretical, stuck in the theoretical, and it's a really horrible place to stay. I think this is why there's jokes about psychiatrists being the most neurotic people on the planet, is because they often are stuck in the theoretical. They don't do this energy building aspect. Um, what we want to do is build our energy because when a limiting self-image takes control of you, takes hold of you, it really does feel like it's taking control because it's more than just a thought. It carries with it a whole way of being, a whole state of mind, and there, you can feel it physically in your body. If you feel small, for example, there's a whole state of mind that goes with it, and you may actually even feel like physically small, like pressure coming down on your shoulders. And so it's just all consuming. And even if you tell yourself, this is not real, this is not a real state of mind, this is false, it's still so consuming that it's hard to see beyond it. It becomes the veil through which we see the world, the assumptions through which we see the world. And so we need to question these assumptions. And one very important aspect of doing that is energy building. It allows us eventually to pull out of it, not initially because it takes time to build our energy, but once, if we keep a, a constant practice going of building energy, whatever methods you use, meditation or yoga or tai chi, or if you're using contemplation as a way of building energy, whatever it is, once our energy is a bit stronger, we find that we can pull ourselves out of these images, even though they are quite strong. We can pull ourselves out of them at least enough to be able to look at it objectively and say, this is not who I am. This is not real. It's only real as an image, as a self-image that I learned in childhood, something I need to look at. And we can start to, instead of believing those voices in our head and giving them power, we can see them as existing in a providential way, as, um, as clues 
of what it is we need to look at, which is again why we're keeping the journal. And we can start to use them then in a productive way. And so it takes on a whole different way of being and a whole different attitude towards dealing with them. Now, there is a role for courage, willpower, and discipline. In Eastern systems, they say this is all you really need because these images are false. And so if you see the falsehood of them, then you can ignore them. Well, I think we see in practice it doesn't quite work that way. If we have these limiting images, they will interfere with our studies, whether we're doing one of the Eastern um, wisdom traditions or we're doing Platonism. It's hard to get into it if you feel this distracting, this need to find a distraction, for example, or you're feeling small and limited. And so there's a part of you that says, yes, this is true, but there's another part saying, I can't be that. And so it just becomes a real struggle. And so a better way is to deal with it directly, to look at the actual substance of the thought, not just call it maya or um, illusion or mind junk and try to push it away, but to actually understand the content of it. We need to see how we ever convinced ourselves of something false, why we convinced ourselves of something false. As we saw in the opening quote, we need to clear away what is false before truth can surface and just kind of organically become who we are or let us manifest that in the world of, as who we really are. So there is a role for courage, willpower, and discipline, but it's more in this effort to clear away what is false and then to live that healthier way in the world. And the way we're going to do this is by looking for patterns that we picked up in childhood. Now, initially, we will see more of just a overall way that our family functioned. In future videos, I'll talk about how to trace that back to actually a first time that we picked up a false belief. But initially, we're going to see are these patterns. And to give a very simple example, imagine that a child, whenever playing in, in an open, creative state, a mom or dad gets really agitated and annoyed and, oh, clean your room or you need to do your homework. Well, you can see how that child would grow up to feel that the practical things are what are important. And so that would become a block later on in life. And what we're going to find is that we want to look at for these sorts of patterns. And that was just one example of one, but there are many others in our life that we want to pick up on. And we want to eventually see the false beliefs that we learned as a child. Now, one thing that's important to point out here is that they were learned as a child, but not necessarily explicitly taught. The parent may not even realize that they're teaching this lesson that practical matters are more important. Because just as we are conditioned in these ways, our parents were as well. We'll find that the same beliefs we have, our parents have, and it's, it covers, it goes over many, many generations. So they don't even realize they have this belief. And then in addition to this, another problem is that as children, we tend to internalize things and we may walk away with conclusions that our parents absolutely would never intend. For example, um, the child who is told to clean your room, don't do this creativity, this creative as um, activity, whatever it is. Um, not only will the child walk away thinking that practical matters are more important, but it's also possible the child will walk away thinking, oh, mom was really aggravated with me. I must have done something wrong. I must be bad. Or dad was angry, so... I must be no good because I was really enjoying myself and it was something bad, so there's something wrong with me. These sorts of beliefs our parents never intended to teach us, but we often walk away with them. And so if false beliefs that we hold are things that we learned as a child, but we weren't necessarily taught. And that's actually what gives them their power. Nobody told us this. When people tell us stuff, we sometimes forget it. But when it's our own conclusion, we hold on to it. And what we're going to find, um, as we once we're able to really narrow it down to one event, the first time we reach that conclusion, we're going to find that it's very often something quite mundane, something easy to forget. That's why they're hard to remember. That's why we have to first look for these patterns, and it takes so long. They're so easy to forget. And if you forgot how you picked up the conclusion, that means you never can analyze the conclusion. As children, we certainly didn't analyze it. We just walked away with this conclusion. We believed it. 
and we started acting on it and we forgot the mundane um, events that caused us to reach that conclusion in the first place. And then as adults, we don't remember these events and so we can never analyze them. And that's why you can't talk yourself out of it. You can't figure out why you believe this silly thing in the first place. But once you can see that, that's when you can start to drop it. That's when you can start to apply logic to it. And when we see the falsehood of these lessons, that's when they start to lose their power. And so that's really where we're going with this. And so initially what we want to do is see those patterns. Now once we are able to see through something, see the cause and effect relationship there, they do start to lose their power, but we still have to go one extra step. We still have to actively choose to act on these insights. And that's because the limiting self-image is so natural and so normal to us that it may, even though we see through it on some theoretical level, we may still feel like it's natural and acting in a different way. Dropping that belief feels fake. It feels like we're faking it till you make it. And many people don't like that feeling. But actually, once you, you risk that chance of acting on your insights, you'll find that people will respond to you in a positive way and it will feel natural and it will just kind of organically um, happen. That You know, the idea of um, the theory of recollection, it, f it functions here as well. Not only is that true about learning philosophy, or it's not about putting information in you, it's about pulling out the wisdom that your soul already holds. And the same is true here. Acting in an unlimited, in a wiser way, in a, in a way that is not constrained by all these silly beliefs that we picked up, is actually quite natural. It's just that these limiting beliefs have convinced us that it's not who we really are. Once we can throw them away, we can start to act in this more natural way. Okay, so the first step then is keeping a journal. Now, for those of you who try it, and I do recommend this, you want to not only write down what is the daydream you went off on or what is the tangent memory that you went off on, but you want to also write down how it felt, how it feels emotionally, how it feels physically, because and put as many words on it as you can. Because these we're going to find are the breadcrumb trail that we're going to trace back through, through our whole lives. We'll find that it's so natural feeling. We felt it in our recent past. We felt it in our school days. We felt it as very small children. And so we want to find those patterns. And that's what we're going to trace back. Because the events on the surface, there will always be something different about them. We never repeat the exact same events over and over again but where there is going to be this feeling that runs through all of them, and that's what we're going to be tracing back. So if you try this, um, you're probably going to hit some difficulties. It is hard to get into at first. Um, if you have any problems or any questions along the way, want any help along the way, feel free to send me an email. There is an email address below. And also, you know, I think other people would also be interested in seeing um, your experiences. So please leave a comment below as well. And I enjoy reading the comments as well. And if you like this sort of content and you find it helpful, I would appreciate you hitting the thumbs up. It does help the algorithm and it lets me know if this kind of content is helpful or not. Uh, from next week, I will be getting back into metaphysics. I'll be doing a video on being in essence and looking at how they are different. So I do hope you'll join me for that.